Okay, um, and welcome to Keep Pie Pie Friday Night Happy Hour. And tonight's guest is fellow Marn Lucas. And I, I'm going to go ahead and uh, mute myself and put this. Go ahead, Marn, if you want to share your. I'm going to put you on speaker so that it'll just be your picture. Okay, let's see. Let me get this. Hmm. Hmm. Can you see my screen? Not yet. Okay. I'm in Google Slides, so okay. I have to do that within Zoom. One second. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Right. I'm gonna change that so it's just you talking. And there we go. All right, mm. you're all set. Okay. One moment. Just remind everybody to mute themselves if they haven't already that's just joined us. Good evening, everyone from New York City, uh, Lenape Hoking in Harlem. Uh, my name is Martin Lucas, and I'm going to be doing a curatorial presentation for Key Pai Pai. Um, are you seeing my screen? Just double checking. Yes. Okay. One moment. Okay. Uh, the curatorial project I want to present is Psychopomp, Guiding Death and Transformation. Uh, it's a group exhibition. There are 14 artists. A psychopomp is a guide whose main function is to escort souls to the afterlife, or it could be uh, someone like myself, a spiritual guide of a living person's um, life and soul. Um, I find a lot of beauty in the topic of death. Uh, most people don't want to talk about death, but um, there's a real marriage between my art and life, um, being an artist, I'm an end of life doula, and then I collaborate with dying artists to establish, uh, establish legacy projects. So this is a subject that I sort of swim in. Um, and this, I feel like these artists really translate ideas about death, dying, loss, um, decay, and the kind of magic of transformation. The first artist is Chris Brunkhart. Um, he was my first collaborator on my Bardo project. He was a landscape photographer from Portland, Oregon, um, and then lived in New York City for a while. And this picture he made as his last body of work on a bucket list trip to Iceland with his husband. And I joined he and his husband on their honeymoon um, for this project. This is a portrait I made of Chris Brunkhart um, out in the field in Iceland. And then in absentia, after he passed, I made the gloved hand on the right. And it's in a relaxed manner as though he's holding his camera. So I made that um, at a residency at Arts Industry uh, about a month after he passed. I went there to do this residency and I had kept his glove as a good luck charm um, from that trip. And so that's how I was able to kind of get that idea to make his hand. This is Alyssa Taylor Went. She's a multidisciplinary artist uh, based in Austin, Texas and Detroit. Um, she's a filmmaker, photographer, performance artist. She herself also curates exhibitions about death and dying um, of which I've been a part of. And this installation is about um, sort of those objects ranging from Egyptian artifacts all the way to refugee belongings um, as if they were, you know, escaping Syria. And everything in this installation are personal objects that she herself collects and has, a, you know, a connection to or part of her family history, or she made them herself. This is an African-American artist, Titus Kafar. Um, this is a very large oil painting, The Aftermath. 
uh, from a series called From a Tropical Space. And in all of the paintings in the series, the children have been cut out of the canvas after they've been painted. And to me, this really translated, you know, loss, uh, grief, um, sort of the tragedy that's happening today and all the civil unrest um, in Black America, which is our America. Um, but I really feel like this is such a beautiful painting. There's so much like life and color and beauty, but then also just tragedy and loss. This is Plague Manifesto by Joy Ray, one of our Key Pie Pie artists. Um, and you can see in the upper right-hand corner where Joy is in the photo, you really get the sense of the graph uh, that she was referring to of the uh, COVID-19 cases in Hawaii at the time in which she was making it in 2020. And uh, this detail to me really sums up sort of that span from life to death, that little bit of red string. I remember seeing it in person at Kahilu Theater and those little bits of red really felt not, not like, uh, like a wound, but also just like life, like blood, like springing forth, which is strangely like a positive aspect to this kind of intense like black and white and string and just a lot of grit and a lot of texture. Um, you know, some of it looks like tar or lava, but um, I really feel like this piece has that full span of the whole life cycle in it. This is a Danish artist, Frodo Mikkelsen. Um, the Skull Collector's house is, each piece is unique. So he does have, um, a friend who's a collector of his work, but he also, this collector collects skulls and has to hide them from his wife who doesn't like them. So he keeps all the skulls in his country house. So Frodo made this piece about that collector. Um, I actually have this piece in my house. I live with it and I find it very entertaining and hilarious. I don't know. It's a human size skull and he makes them with like found objects from flea markets that he goes to like in Berlin um, and then uses like dental, um, like dental cement and clay to kind of build up the, the sculpture and then has them um, electroplated with silver. He actually doesn't even like silver, but he likes to use silver for these objects. This is Raven Half Moon, a Native American artist from the Caddo Nation. Um, she's from Norman, Oklahoma now residing in Helena, Montana. These are massive ceramic sculptures. I actually just saw these uh, about a week ago in New York City at, um, oh, where was it? I'll think of it, I'll think of the gallery, but this work knocked me out. The pieces are, they're simple, they're very heavy. I love that she sort of tags her own name, Raven Half Moon, kind of just scrawls it onto the piece sort of like, tagging her own work, but also really like reclaiming her, you know, her native history. And to this, to this work, it really feels like a connection to ancestors, um, inherited trauma, but also rebirth. Like, you know, Native Americans are not going anywhere. They have a very vibrant present, um, this notion that they are, you know, gone or dying off is, that's a really white colonial point of view. And this is a young woman making these massive bold works. Um, so I had not seen her work before, um, but when I saw it like completely altered uh, this sort of exhibition concept. I'll show you a little bit of an excerpt from a film that I made with Jakob Pander, and this is thermal infrared video that shows heat and light that is uh, actually in the body. There's no special effects. It's just very sensitive. Oh, what? This has been playing just fine.
One minute. So this film has no dialogue. It's just an experimental soundtrack. Um, this woman is responding to cold water, but it's meant to imply disease or decay. I'll just jump ahead to a couple of clips. She's a buto dancer. At the time that we were making this film, we were sort of referring to SARS as a potential sort of plague. Um, so she gets continuously more and more kind of decayed and dying and falling apart throughout this video. This is sort of like at the end, the other character comes in to try to help her. Again, anything that's white is heat. Uh, anything that's cold or wet is black or dark. It's rather eerie, um, and it is in the tradition of Bhutto. Is this posted anywhere publicly, Marn, that people can look at it later? Marn? Yes. Is this posted publicly where anyone can watch it? If yeah, I can send a link. Um, yes, I'll send you guys a link because okay, I'm. Great. I just that's enough video for that. Okay. So this is an excerpt of a four channel film about life cycles. So there's birth and death and courtship um, kind of as seen in these kind of abstract landscapes, but that is one of the uh, death scenes. This is photography by a Houston, uh, Houston Texas uh, photographer, Angel Lartigue. Um, he's actually worked in forensics. Um, he worked in a field where you have uh, the forensic cadavers and he would go out and do research and make drawings. And he uses um, and microbes in the body as part of his- Oh, uh, let's see, where am I? Liz, can you please uh, mute yourself? Got it. So in this photograph, this is a collaboration with uh, photographer Terry Garcia. This costume he has made and it's all maggots and bacteria and microbes. And on the right with the detail, that's the artist himself uh, with the contact lenses. And he's wearing family human teeth on his face and these milagros. And then I'll show you. These are some details of the costume. And he likes to explore putrefaction, the whole process of putrefaction as a raw material. So um, all kind of decompositional processes he uses in his artwork. So there's like fungi and insects, even like bad odors and maggots in his artwork. So it's pretty intense, but then he also makes these very beautiful sort of like techno fashion costumes. And you'll see this work in his performance, uh, in video, photography. And then this is another one of his photographs, Museum of Resurrection. And he actually takes samples with Q-tips around various public sites in museums. Uh, right now he's in Mexico City, um, continuing this work. So he takes actual microbe samples, cultures it in the Petri dish. And so he calls that like a transfer of memories through these microorganisms. And he makes really beautiful photographs. And I love just, he's a known in the bio artist kind of world. And I really like that he uses decay and microbes as, you know, one of his artistic mediums.
This is Soul Soul by Joanne Leah. She's a New York artist. Um, and this is just gold leaf on the bottom of a foot on a paper backdrop. But it, to me, it looks like a, like a Roman sandal. Um, it's both like of the body, but also seems like a, a footprint, sort of about the, feels like life leaving the body and you know being left behind as this beautiful relic. David Wojnarowicz, uh, he was a very famous Polish American photographer in the East Village scene in New York City. Um, he was a photographer, a writer, a performance artist, um, act and a major AIDS activist. And he did die of uh, AIDS complications in 1992 when he was only 37 years old. I love this painting, Americans Can't Deal With Death. Um, I love this beautiful still life superimposed with the uh, Excav excavation imagery and the gas mask. It's a fantastic painting. This is another Key Pai Pai artist, Christopher Rico. Um, I came across this incredible painting, just kind of scrolling through Instagram and looking at his feed and looking at his website and this stopped me dead in my tracks. Uh, it is such a ethereal, ghostly image. And to me, it symbolizes transformation, you know, post death, like the magic of whatever worlds are out there beyond. Um, to me, it looks like a figure or a shell or, you know, where we all come from, the vagina. <laughs> it's, it's really an arresting, arresting image. And I would love if Christopher, you know, if Rico could get on and say a brief bit about peace. Rico, you're here, if you would like yeah, to. Yeah, oh, Thank you. Thank you. Um, so yeah, this body of work um, was, I guess the important thing to know about it is it was created without touching the surface. Uh, so all the paints poured and then manipulated um, through air pneumatic tools. Um, and I did this work for about a decade. Um, and uh, it, very much about mystery and spirituality. And it was a, a time of isolation for me uh, geographically. And uh, I just was shedding basically in, <clears throat> in this studio in a tiny, tiny town in rural South Carolina. And uh, I locked myself away and just painted ton of paintings and this, this one is just a very special one to me it was um loosely related to a children's story i wrote for um my best friend's son so thank you i love that uh you're using pneumatic tools which is sort of like mimicking breath outside the body so you didn't touch the actual surface with your body and using power tools it's like a form of breath This is Gavin Wilson. Uh, this is a huge pencil drawing. It's just a uh, pencil on paper. Uh, unnamed, stable and true, penetrate traits being the sight in hand. This work is very much about transformation. It is, while there is bondage involved, it is not about uh, sexual bondage at all. I mean, it's, uh, they're all self portraits. He's done nine drawings so far at this scale. Um, that are related. And there's a lot of like macro and micro and uh, different kinds of worlds within worlds. And he himself is the character in each of these figures. So they're all self portraits. So he shoots his own, uh, he makes the costumes, he does his own tying. Um, he uh, makes a huge Photoshop map or key to then make the drawing from and so all the material is his own. And it's, these take several months to make. And I made a little video here in his studio last week, just to give you a sense of the worlds within worlds and the detail. Gavin has a pretty um, focused meditation practice and an incredible attention to his craft. 
he draws all the time. He's very uh, ritualistic and very committed. And I've been watching these drawings happen for years. And last week we shot some uh, new scrap photo for his 10th drawing. So it's photographing him in his costumes in these crazy positions so that he could use it for this work. So here's a detail of the face. Uh, the blue latex costume he made, that's him inside of that costume and it's all hand stitched. There's no gluing or uh, so, you know, sewing machine used. And then that's a portrait that I made of the artist uh, in one of his costumes in his studio. So it's just a bit about the process. Uh, this is Vessels by Esteban Cabeza de Vaca. Um, he is of Mexican and Native American heritage. He is from um, San Isidro, California, now living in Queens. Um, he is actually a direct, has a direct ancestral link to the conquistador turned spiritual healer, uh, Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca. So he's got like a complicated relationship with that sort of history. Um, and draws a lot on his experiences of, you know, growing up on the Mexican border um, and had very activist parents. So all of that is kind of informing these paintings. And uh, I love the mix of painterly styles, a little bit of like tagging going on, like graffiti, um, and then hand thrown pots um, and use of, you know, landscape materials from the land. You know, the paintings have the same colors as the materials that come from the landscape. And again, for me, this is about, you know, ancestors and past and future and transformation. And this is the last artist. Um, she Gathers Me in Radiant Light by Mariana Pomonis, another one of our Key Pai Pai artists um, and her work embracing the feminine and sort of the supernatural. Um, to me, this is just an incredibly sublime uh, painting in a very modernist geometric expression of the spiritual. Um, it has, you know, a bit of the Ouroboros. It has, you know, all the cycles of life in it. Uh, at least to me, you know, creation, destruction. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I guess this would be church for me to sit in front of this painting. So my approach to all of these artists has been, it's very, very intuitive. It's like, it has to speak to me. I have to be sort of like a goosebumps or have the wind knocked out of me. That's how I sort of organize uh, art in my mind. And this will be up if you, you can find this later, but these are all the artists in order of appearance with all of their kind of social media handles so people can go and look them up and enjoy their work. And that's it, that's 14 artists. I could have gone, I could have had 50 artists in this group, it was really, challenging. I'm a maximalist. It was really hard for me to limit it to 14. It kept crawling up to 20 and then back down to 12. And because this is a presentation online um, and we're not enjoying this in person, you know, I try to be considerate of that. But for me, uh, this is an endlessly pleasing thing to put artists together and to connect artists. I mean, that's why Key Pai Pai speaks so much to me is that idea of connecting people and ideas, but in a really deep, meaningful way. So I really appreciate the opportunity to do sort of a curatorial project, it's something I haven't done in a long time. Um, I used to curate art shows and I left it behind because it was so, I don't know, sometimes challenging dealing with artists, I gotta say, and this made me realize how much I miss it. So thank you. I, I think we need to find a venue for this. Just, just saying. It's be a lot of shipping. 
<laughs> a lot oh, of heavy so giant Andy, pieces. I just wrote in the chat. Oh, I can't see the chat. Hold on. Let me see I if I can. See, I want to see this show in person. And then I wrote, oh. hint, hint, Andy. That's what I wrote. <laughs> hint, hint, Andy. This is a great show and so many. can go back. And to go from Rojnardovitz to complete unknowns, I mean, that's amazing. And the diversity. And he did say they could be anyone alive or dead. So yeah, I'll just go backwards to do some of these. Um, and, and that's the idea, right? Behind this kind of exercise is right. to take your work, which you absolutely did and contextualize it with both contemporary artists, your peers and mm -hmm. historic and historically relevant artists. So um, I love this. I think this is a beautiful, beautiful presentation, but I have to say, I'm really interested in seeing this um, come, it's like turn into an exhibition because I, mm -hmm. I would really like to have a relationship. So one thing with I wanted to say is that I this has been a back pocket thing for a long time. Like when I started Bardo Project, I'm making my work, but I'm constantly looking at art and constantly like wanting to I, my brain just wants to make connections between artists and artworks. So I have been wanting to do a group exhibition and, you know, spaces in New York is next to impossible. You know, now things have changed with the pandemic, but even prior to that, like, you know, thought about doing an online exhibition prior to the pandemic. And I was like, oh, it's so much work. I really want people to be able to walk through these pieces. Cause in my, you know, I didn't have time, but I would, I wanted to make a maquette of like, where these works are next to each other, which pieces are on the floor, which pieces are coming down from the ceiling, you know? So for me, it's really about the whole space. So it is something I've always wanted to do is a show about death and dying. Um, the artist whose work I showed, Alyssa Taylor went, she had a 64 artist exhibition in Austin, Texas um, that this piece was in and demo gallery was going to be demolished at the end of the exhibition, which is brilliant. And so there were pieces that were built into the space that the artists wanted them to be destroyed with the building when they, you know, knocked the building down. So, um, so I've been in other exhibitions about death and dying, but you know, there's so much room for interpretation. Like one thing I did not put in this show was a lot about grief. I mean, the image by um, uh, Titus Kafar would, you know, probably cover grief, but you could do an entire exhibition just on grief. So there's so many aspects about this subject. Like, I don't think I could even cover it. I really enjoyed the fact that the majority of the work was not about the body. Like, it, and that's hard for me because I love working about the body and I tried really hard not to. <laughs> Yeah, no, it, it's lovely that it's because we always associate like the body and the transformation of the body and what happens in death. Mm -hmm. And there's so many other things that could represent that physical change other than literally showing the body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think you did that. I think you represented that really well in all of this work. Okay, I'm writing something down. I just saw that there's... A Mariana Pomona says there's a Museum of Spiritual Art in St. Louis. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's Mokra, M-O-C-R-A. Okay. A religious art, something like that. But it, I know people who've done, uh, who've made pieces there that are, it's not denominational in any way, but it's about spiritual issues. Uh, although the, the guy who runs it is a priest, isn't he? I don't know. I just know. Um, if if uh, he's still running it, I met him a few years ago. He's actually quite wonderful. And uh, Jim Morphesis has shown there more than once. You're right. If you know his work. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a really great venue. Even if you put it in LA, you might want to also put it there if you're going to bring this stuff into and in, bring it, this stuff together. It's such a great show, really, Marn. Well, thank you. I, I, everybody should get, do this. It's, it's been really fun. It's been really fun. And there were so many things I had in, but I really did make an effort to balance like male artists and female artists and African-American artists and Native American artists, because that is important to me. It's having it be, you know, really spread out in terms of like different ages and backgrounds. And so I think about like social aspects quite a bit, not just responding to the work. I mean, it's, 
that's just how my mind works. So I make it a little bit, uh, it makes it pretty challenging, but um, I would like to have, I don't know, I think I would like to have also more elder artists making work about these subjects. Mm -hmm. So that's something I think is lacking in this show, but I can add that. Marn, I um, just have to say, uh, gosh, there's a lot of things, but um, first off, I want to have that name Raven Half Moon. I want that to be my name. <laughs> That's a great name. Um, the the, the um, area of research in inherited trauma is really compelling inherited trauma as opposed to all the other things that we are dealing with. But as, um, as a person who has inherited, you know, family things, and then as a mother who, you know, is going, oh my God, you know, if, if I passed on stuff from generations ago is I think a really complex issue Mm -hmm. And I think like Andy said, by not really focusing on the body, but just the, the things of life is um, effective in, in, in expressing inherited trauma. And I just wondered, how did you come to that point? How did you come to that decision of exploring that exploring inherited trauma specifically yes specifically. Um, i mean that's a more recent thing i'm aware of like i would say in the last five years um obviously like you know the holocaust is a classic example and the persecution of the jews i mean that is like the most studied example of inherited trauma because it's something you can clearly track like persecution of the Jews for centuries and centuries and centuries. So that's where a lot of the, uh, the research I've seen is about. Um, the artist that I presented tonight, Alyssa Taylor Went, actually did just curate an exhibition about inherited trauma. Um, and she said it was very challenging. You know, how do you, how do you convey that? It's, it's, um, it's so intense and so traumatic, but then to convey it without it being like just hitting people on the head with it, it's, I, uh, I don't think I could tackle that. Um, so that is an area of research I'm not super familiar with. I'm just scratching the surface. For me, my skill set, my expertise is truly helping people transition through their death, being at the bedside, I don't want to do the administrative things. I really hold space for people. So for me, I'm really more about that space. And then creatively, it's it's more broad and more abstract. And more spiritual. And more spiritual. Yeah. The other thing that's cool about um, this idea or this concept, if you decide to, to pitch to the Museum of uh, which mm -hmm. religious art that um, it looks like uh, Betty's offering to help you do that, which is amazing. Um, they have an incredible collection of Anselm Kiefer pieces at the St. Louis Art Museum that don't always get looked at because things are in storage a lot. But um, it and a lot of that work is about the trauma of um, you know being a survivor or a Holocaust survivor, and then the memory and archiving of that that event within mm -hmm. cultural history. Um, and there's just a, a tremendous, there's just a tremendous collection of German painting and uh, German sculpture and because there's a large German population in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. So that's um, in terms of borrowing things from museums, there are, there's a lot in that community yeah. that would refer to what you're talking about. Thank you for that. Marianne, you're, you're so right. Kiefer would be a perfect addition to this mm -hmm. show. Totally mm -hmm. agree. Yeah. Yep. If yeah. you guys, if you decide to move forward with this, um, let's talk offline because I also have a director of one of the big museums there that's a personal friend. And we could see what we can borrow. Exciting. This has been so much more fun to work on. I'm working on the creative capital application right now. 
And so this has been, and it's due in a week. And I got so deep into this. And I mean, my, uh, yeah, I went, I went really, really deep into this. It was, um, yeah, I wish I could just change my creative capital application to this. <laughs> I'd be ready to go. <laughs> That's funny. So, well, but why don't you? Uh, I'm pretty well. I'm very invested in Bardo Project. It's been like the last seven years of my life. So I do feel like my project, where I'm collaborating with artists with terminal illnesses on legacy projects, I just feel like that really has to happen. It's far more difficult than trying to put together. Oh, and they actually, Creative Capital doesn't like to fund so much group exhibitions. Right. Um, you know, they fund really challenging projects. So trying to figure out how to support my project so that I can work with more artists nationwide, you know, in a much broader setting. I just, that's, that is my, mm -hmm life's work and I feel like that's my legacy I don't have children like that is my legacy in advance so that's really like if I had only one shot at that grant it would be for Bardo Project so gotcha yeah and I think the feedback you're getting Marn is a reminder to the rest of us artists why we should be curating a show just like you did yeah. Um, does anybody have any other questions for Marn before I start talking about Key Pie Pie stuff? This has uh, been a really beautiful example of, again, I said this earlier, um, of organizing ideas around a central idea and organizing work that supports that visually um, with both uh, the artist peers and, um, and, and others. Um, and I, I really hope that the rest of our Key Pai Pai fellows will, um, will jump in here and do this for themselves. Um, I, and I wanted to ask you about that, uh, Marn. Um, yes. Do you wanna kind of just elaborate on this experience for yourself and how this, uh, how this affected your own practice? Which part, this doing yeah, the- organizing this kind of exhibition, this digital exhibition. Um, it's been years since I've put together a group show, but I mean, I do have, I have so many folders on my hard drive of like group exhibition on death. <laughs> so it really changed. I thought, oh, this will be so easy because I already have 20 artists in a folder. A lot of them are friends, work I'm familiar with. Um, my house is filled with art about death. I mean, my partner's like, no more. Like, can we stop? Because he works in the ICU. He's like, he doesn't want to see it. So I thought it would be like, oh, this is going to be easy. I'll just like slap some images there. And then when I put those together and then I went out and I went out and looked at work here in New York for three weeks straight. I just went to museum shows. I went to galleries. I really got out there, which was thrilling to have a destination and not be at home. Like, I had places to go. And then, so it's really been very uplifting even though it's this subject matter. And the more work I looked at, the more inspired I got. And I realized I was gonna have a very hard time narrowing it down. And my other option was just do work about artists who are dying, right? But that's so close to what I do. Um, and so I decided like, I wanted to show a bunch of work of people that I did not know and had never, I mean, a bunch of these artists, I had not seen their work before. I walked in the room and was blown away. And maybe my lens is more about death and dying and transformation. Maybe other people see, oh, it's beautiful, it's pretty. It has pinks and oranges and human forms. Um, I think my lens really is about death and transformation. And it's partly where I'm at in my life and my career and, um, yeah, this process has been very illuminating about the conversations that are out there between these works of art. Like everything I saw in the last three weeks in New York was either very surreal or seemingly open about change. Because mm -hmm. we're in a pandemic and the work was 
pretty vibrant. I gotta say, there was hardly any work that was black and white. It was all bold, colorful, vibrant work. And it, for me, it was like, oh, okay. I don't have to sit in this pandemic state of mind and be focused on how things used to be. Like that's, we, if we don't move forward, we're just gonna get left in the dust. And so I don't know, it's, this has been very inspiring about getting excited, thinking about the future, thinking about different possibilities. I still don't know what that means in terms of like, how do we show work? You know, of course, a lot of us artists are still very attached to like, I would love to put my stuff on a gallery wall, but we're having to really stretch and grow right now. And this exercise really pushed me. So, so, so good. I, I just I, love that every single piece has this like very strong transformative statement to it. And, and it's, and it couldn't be more relevant right now in this state of our affairs uh, to think about state of flux. Yep. And, and change. And so super well done. Bravo. If I knew how to do Google SketchUp, I would have had like, you know, I really wanted to convey like these works are on this wall, you know, cause I still think in terms of a physical space. Sure. Um, otherwise I feel a little bit untethered and I would love to be able to show like where these works are in relation to each other. And then loosely there was kind of, it started with, you know, being about dying and decay, death and then transformation. And then of course it's just start in my mind, we just start all over again, you know, like this, show is supposed to be like an Ouroboros, which is behind me. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think there's enough people here tonight um, that you're gonna have some conversations offline uh, sure. that we can try to make that happen. Uh, get this physically on the wall so people can have an experience um, in person and uh, be able to make those visual connections. You know, as I look here, I see that, or as I, as I stand mm -hmm. here, I see those two things. And mm -hmm. I, I think, um, I think I agree. I think this work is really strong, all of it. And it would be wonderful to see it in, in real time and in, and the dialogue that it's having physically in a space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Marn. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, How about Marn? Does anybody uh, have any questions about putting one of these presentations together? Um, I, I think we're, I think Marn was our last scheduled artist. Um, and I'd really, I mean, we talked about it. We've been talking about it since November and we've had quite a few presentations since then, but um, I think we're kind of at the end of the folks that are, have signed up. Um, I can fill the next few weeks with some of our key Pi Pi faculty and talking about some professional um, strategies. And, uh, but I do, I really am serious about getting our fellows to uh, organize a presentation like Marn put on tonight. And again, contextualizing your own work uh, by presenting other artists uh, with that work. So um, anyway, I think about it. Oh, go ahead, Marn. Well, I didn't know like how long I know we have her on here for about an hour. So my goal was like under 25 minutes and I realized I went pretty quickly, but I usually tell stories and I end up going for an hour. So this is probably the fastest I've ever gone on a presentation, but you know, like maybe give everybody a parameter, like maximum amount of minutes or. Yeah, I think that we talked about it should be about 30 minutes long. Okay. Um, and then, you know, often we start a little bit late because everyone's talking and, and, or sure. on and, and then after the presentation, we have, you know, conversation like this. Um, so we end up being on here, uh, just shy of an hour, which I think is, most people, when they go to watch it later, uh, will right. we'll stick around for the whole thing. Um, if it's not, if it's, if it's longer than an hour, you know, usually lose people. So, um, but, oh, uh, Christine Frouche says, who do we contact to sign up? You can either let me know or let Catherine know. Um, and we'll pick a Friday. Um, and we would love to have any of you sign up. So 
All right, you guys. Well, thanks again, Marn. And thank you everyone for logging on tonight for our Friday uh, Key Pie Pie Happy Hour. Um, I don't think we have anybody next week, but you can remember that we do have uh, Wednesday. I have open office hours on Zoom. You can find that link both on the I'm an artist.net network and on our Key Pie Pie Fellows um, private Facebook group. And um, these Andy, can I jump in here one quick minute? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if you're sitting there thinking you want to curate a show, but you're techno terrified of having to put together a PowerPoint and screen share it on Zoom, I will help you with that. Oh my gosh, Betty, that's so generous. Thank you. I mean, within reason. Yeah. But I will help you with that because that should not be what stops you. That you saw how cool this is and how much we all love it. You can do that too, and I will help you with techno technology to help you get you started. Okay, sorry yeah. to interrupt, Andy. No, that's fine. No, thank you. I think that's a super generous offer. And one more reason why you should all be doing this, um, to be able to work with Betty is an honor and uh, and she is super brilliant. So take advantage of her offer and, and, and work with her. Um, yeah, anyway. Thank you all tonight. And thank you, uh, Marn, for this beautiful presentation. And I hope to see you all either next Wednesday at open uh, my open office hours. Oh, don't forget, Ray Beldner also has open office hours on Thursday. I'm sorry, on Tuesday, Tuesday mornings. Tuesday. Yeah. So Tuesday um, at nine. yeah, visit Ray and me. We're 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 here. It's it's a freebie. It's we're a just freebie. having coffee in the morning. Come visit yeah. us. Yeah. No big whoop. Yeah. yeah. And thank you to all my Key Pie Pie fellows for being in this Marn. show. Marn, you did a great job. Thank you, Marn. Great, great job, Marn. Awesome. Great presentation. That was fun. amazing. Thank yeah. you. All right, all right, you guys. Good night. Yeah. And, uh, Good night. We'll Good night, we'll night everybody. Andy, so thank, you. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Bye. 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 Bye.